Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. Please consider becoming a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can listen to Labyrinths ad-free. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson to learn more. You said last week that if you were going to put out a mini series about ethics and true crime, you would want it to either be really, really good or just not do it. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? (laughs) Why? Because the world doesn't need just another mediocre true crime series. And if it's going to be a series specifically that takes a meta look at true crime, it especially needs to ask all the right questions. The last thing that I would want is for people to come away from a podcast about true crime ethics not feeling like it gave them perspective on their own participation in what could be a harm that is being caused constantly as we speak. Bad true crime is like a serial killer, and it's just victims after victims are happening right now because people are doing true crime wrong. And that's why it's so important. You can't do it in a vague, wishy-washy, mediocre way. You have to do it right, and you have to leave an impact, or you might as well go home. You're just another person speculating about nonsense in the darkness. I thought my only way out was to kill myself. I didn't know what else to do. I went into complete shock. I disassociated. They see it as entertainment. They don't see us as real people. The online sleuths, you know, I've got a very complicated history with that group. My stories have gotten people freed from prison. It's helped catch killers. There is no standards and protocols for how to handle any of that. And so you end up just chewing on the same nonsense until you're deep in a twisted funhouse of mirrors. Somebody asked, is it disrespectful if I wear something that has blood spatter on? It It sells newspapers, it sells magazines, it gets viewership. And that's what it's all about. It's money, money, money. Feeling lost? Then you're in the right place. I'm Amanda Knox. And I'm Christopher Robinson. And this is Blood Money, a Labyrinth miniseries. What you heard at the top of this episode was a conversation between me and our production assistant, Sophia. We sat down together to discuss this miniseries, which we were in the process of developing. Making this series has been hard. It's an emotional topic for both of us, one with deeply personal stakes. I've been the subject of countless true crime narratives, the vast majority of which I haven't consented to. I've also watched that same thing happen again and again to other people. I get messages all the time from people going through the worst experience of their lives. Sometimes those people are at the center of true crime cases themselves and look to me for guidance. I give what advice I can, but the truth is, I don't have all the answers. I'm just a regular person struggling to navigate all of this myself. As we bring this miniseries to a close, we still don't have a clear answer to our initial question. Because when you talk about ethics and true crime, it's hard to find people who agree. Even if we can all point to the same problem, people have very different ideas about the solution. Where and how should we be directing our empathy in true crime cases? I don't think victim advocacy means learning that Susie liked to sew when she was alive. And I think it's strange that you can't come to a story with empathy for a victim without needing to know everything about them. Hmm. I am already sad that someone has died. I don't need to know what her hobbies were in life. If you need that to humanize somebody, ah, there's something wrong with you. That's Jen Tisdale from part four of our miniseries. Her philosophy on this subject surprised us these victims don't have a voice and maybe they're not going to care if the world knows that their favorite movie, if you're me, it was Back to the Future. But they also don't have a choice what the world learns about them. They want to learn about the systems that are set up that have allowed this crime to happen, whether it's racism or homophobia or sexism. I want to know about the criminal's background. I want to know about their mental illness, if they have any. Those are the things I think that you can do for a victim. And I find it strange when people get so mad that you don't hear about a victim. Personally, I don't need to know anything beyond their names, truly. I think I'm being a little harsh, perhaps, but I just, I think that's what people think about when they hear 
talk about the victims, talk about the victims. I don't think that most true crime fans really care about saving the victim. I think they'd rather paint the picture of a monster. And I think a lot of people want to hear about how they can hate somebody who might have done something bad more than they want to hear about a life that someone might have lived. That's a broad generalization, but I feel that way. Hmm. Like the entertainment value is in the ability to judge somebody. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are very aware of how that feels. I like to come to true crime trying to find empathy for the person who did something bad. And that's not always easy. I feel sorry for people many times. I mean, I have borderline personality disorder. So, you know, I really like to learn about that aspect of true crime, the mental health aspect. I think there are acceptable mental illnesses and there are less acceptable mental illnesses. I call it inside versus outside. Anxiety and depression is really inside of you. And while it can affect others around you, it's like an internal struggle, whereas something like borderline or schizoaffective disorder can also involve violence, and that's outside. Mm So we don't accept outside. We're supposed to be really accepting of everybody with mental health issues unless something happens on the outside. Then they're a monster. We don't care. And I've been in a violent relationship, Amanda. I don't mind sharing with this you where I was the aggressor and I'm filled with shame to this day. But I would love to think that somebody would be just as kind to me or even to a very extreme example, like a Ted Bundy. <laughs> mm. mm-hmm. We can't buffet style go, we're okay with anxiety and depression, but if you're bipolar, fuck off. Right. So it sounds to me like the thing that is super ironic about the true crime genre is that it seems like it's a space where people have permission to demonize things like mental illness where otherwise they would not. Yes, and just demonize the criminals in general. The word monster is thrown around so casually. It's just another way to dehumanize somebody, and we should be really doing the opposite of that because that's how you figure out how this happened. I get very uncomfortable reading how people discuss mental health and criminality it just makes me feel very sad like there's no context if i were to say oh jeffrey Dahmer had borderline personality disorder that's actually really debilitating and terrible what some people might hear is sounds like you love jeffrey Dahmer and hate victims it's like what yeah that was a big leap but yeah no i definitely hear you if you don't condemn somebody people hear that you love them it's wild it's wild out there after writing about the disappearance of three-year-old dylan ehler Catherine Laidlaw also came away with some thoughts on the role of empathy in true crime. There are a few things that have really stayed with me. One is that crime is so often the chronicle of people living out their worst nightmares, even if they are the perpetrators. I think a lot about a defense lawyer once said to me that she doesn't think that sending anyone to jail is cause for celebration. You sort of have the prosecutors on the other side who would consider that a success, and that's not a strike against them. I just think it's emblematic of how we see the consequences of crime as a society. And it's like, no, that failure is on all of us, right? And I think there's just a real lack of care in a lot of instances and lack of, I guess, empathy or human understanding. And no matter what side of the crime you're on, you're not having a good time. You know, I really wanted to help people understand a little bit what the lived experience of being adjacent to a missing person is. And then additionally, what the consequences can be of something that has been held up societally as being exclusively good, the web sleuths. And then Just that even people who don't necessarily look the way that you wish that they did in their lives or behave the way that you wish that they did are still deserving of empathy. That maybe sounds simple, but I really (laughs) think that the way out of some of these situations is care, is just caring a little bit more about the people around us, you know? Yeah. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about what the purpose of true crime is, and if there is an ethics of true crime. Yeah, I wish that the purpose of true crime was towards some kind of justice and healing, whether that's answers, restorative justice of some kind, peacemaking, making the world a better place in the aftermath of being wrongfully accused and convicted. But like the work that you're doing, like I think that true crime can be a vehicle for 
good. And I think that the sort of true crime stories that we tell in society that have really strong social issues undercurrent that highlight inequality in some way or a gap in the system that we need to address or that look constructively at where we can go. Those stories I find both endlessly interesting and deeply valuable. I don't believe anymore in true crime for its own sake. I don't know if I ever did, but I did one story that didn't have an underlying social issue and I hated it during and afterwards. And I thought, this isn't feeding something good in society, you know? And so I think that the question that we have to ask ourselves as true crime storytellers is, how is this going to collectively move us forward? And if there isn't a clear answer, then it's not part of the ethical true crime genre, in my view. Mm -hmm. I think if history tells us anything, true crime is absolutely here to stay. I don't see a place where humans aren't enthralled by it just because it's been that way for hundreds of years. And whether that's good or bad, I think it just is. And I think we have an opportunity now, especially because there's such an appetite for content of all kinds to really think deeply about why we're showcasing the stories that we're showcasing and in the idealized version of the world in the next 10 years it's very literary stories that grapple with questions of how we get to a place where justice is more attainable than it is today is that going to happen? Probably not. But I do think that you see examples of it, right? Like you've got podcasts like Lost Hills, which is a podcast that another New Yorker writer does where, yes, she's looking at potentially wrongfully convicted cases from before, but she's using that to sort of highlight access to justice issues and things like that. And you've got You're Wrong About, which is an, another podcast that's surged in popularity that's sort of looking at and really dismantling these prevalent media narratives around stories like the O.J. Simpson trial. And I think that kind of work is really, really important because it makes more critical thinkers out of all of us, I hope. And maybe that's how we get a little bit closer. But I do have real misgivings about the aspects of true crime that don't advance some of those issues. Yeah. And I, I don't see an end to that, but I hope that it does end because I don't think it's making us better people. Hey listeners, thanks for tuning in. This podcast can only exist thanks to listener support. So please consider becoming a patron. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson. While Catherine Laidlaw isn't holding her breath for the rise of ethical true crime, Sarah Turney, host of the Voices for Justice podcast, is more optimistic. I do think that conscious consumerism is taking over true crime as it is every other industry. You know, you look at everything. You look at food, right? People want to make sure that their eggs are, aren't coming from chickens that are being treated horribly. They want to make sure that the pencils they use aren't destroying forests or whatever. And it's the same for true crime. It's coming. I think that there will be a wave of accountability. I see it coming and coming soon. There's so much money being made in this industry. I mean, I see it. They are asking more questions. Why is this creator covering this case? Is it to help? Is it to create entertainment? What is it for? So I think the future of true crime will benefit people like us. I think people want to hear from people who have experienced true crime firsthand. I never understood why it's such a crazy idea that someone like me made a true crime podcast, someone who is firsthand affected by it. If you're looking for a podcast about nursing, are you going to get that from a random YouTube creator or random influencer just talks about nursing? Somebody in the military, you're listening to a military podcast. You would never listen to it from someone who has no military experience. So why is that happening in true crime? Why is it that 
any person who walks off the street with a microphone can start talking about true crime and raise to the top of the ranks. It's something interesting that I think about all the time, but long story short, I think that consumers are honestly fed up and they want to see something different. They want to see something better. They don't want to see these victims and survivors be treated badly. So I, I always say, like, you know, if, if you're creating true crime that hurts people, your days are numbered. Back in part two of our miniseries, we spoke to Christine Marie. As a reminder, Christine was lied to and manipulated into human trafficking by a false prophet who claimed to be a fellow Mormon. When we left off with her story, Christine had just been re-traumatized by an exploitative docudrama about her ordeal. But after a year of trying to survive the horrible public comments, my mom came to visit and she says, Chrissy, why don't you go back to school? Because I thought my career was over. The way they portrayed me in that terrible piece was like I was brainless. So I started looking at schools and I found this program called media psychology. And by gum, that's what I decided to do. I decided that I was going to enter this doctoral program in media psychology, and I was going to research the very things that I went through. I did my doctoral dissertation on the traumatic impact of media humiliation, misrepresentation, and victim shaming on narrative identity and well-being. And you said it just right, Amanda. What happens when you're misrepresented in the media is it basically fractures your authentic identity and makes you wonder, how can so many people saying the same thing be wrong? Mm -hmm. Until you really can grasp it. No, this is who I am. This happened to me. I did not do this to me. One of the things that I learned is that psychological pain has been identified as the most frequently stated motivation for suicide, and especially when a person was humiliated because they're deprived of belongingness and affiliation. When you're publicly humiliated, you're like shunned and cast out of the family of man. Like you don't belong here. People are coming to me now more and more after my research because they have their stories of what happened to them in their supposed documentary or their supposed reality show. And it's also in social media because when you're in the media, it's not just one platform. You're tweeted about, people talk about you on YouTube, they talk about you on Facebook, and it spreads, as you know. Mm -hmm. So I make an argument that media trauma should be identified as its own form of trauma. The American Psychological Association has a diagnostic manual. It's called the DSM-5. Let me tell you what they have in their notes about whether to diagnose somebody with PTSD. The diagnostic criteria. A, exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. And it gives some ways. Then there's a note that it does not apply to exposure through electronic media, television, movies, or pictures, unless this is work-related. But I didn't have flashbacks until I was publicly humiliated. So I make an argument in my research that there needs to be a modification because people who are publicly shamed lose their sense of identity and well-being. And it does impact every part of life. These are the commonalities that the people I interviewed, this is what they experience, a violation of expectations or betrayal, a compulsion to correct the misinformation, a desire to withdraw from society or even withdraw from life, feeling stigmatized, contagious or radioactive, silencing, a sense of disconnection and numbing, almost like, you know, an out-of-body experience. You can't believe they're really saying these things or this is really happening. Others do not understand. That was a common theme that unless you have been through it, it's really easy for people to say, ah, just ignore them, block them and get over it. 
Mm. No, it's deeper. It's far deeper than that. There's enough requirements in these commonalities that it should be considered as one of the possible contributors to PTSD. There's an impact on economic and material well-being. There's changes in your life world. Some people get doxxed and they have to move or they need security. People have to change careers because of some misrepresentation that they didn't even deserve. There's a sense of loss and mourning and grieving. It's like you lost your legacy and you're in mourning. That's not who I am. The entire world thinks I'm this person. So there's a grieving for your identity and there's the threat of ongoing harm in the future. When you're subjected to this kind of media trauma, your trauma is not only in the past, it's in the present and it's in the future. And every time your episode shows or somebody retweets the negative comment that the president said, or you show up on a news program, it's a new wound. It's not a trigger. It's a new wound. It's a new occurrence. It's a new microaggression against who you really are. So how do you heal when the internet footprint is potentially permanent? This is so difficult to overcome. And this is why I am so, I mean, I have no words now to express how grateful I am that I went through what I did, both the false prophet experience and the media misrepresentation disaster. Because if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have gone back to school. I wouldn't have done this research. And this is incredibly important and relevant today. We've become a divided society where it's okay to shoot weapons of digital hatred and it translates into real world problems. And I'm grateful. This is my post traumatic growth. Post traumatic growth is when you take your negative experience and you find a way to let it make you stronger than you would have been had you not gone through it. And so, this is my joy, my life's work. Not only do I educate on media misrepresentation, I have a charity called Voices for Dignity, and I help people, whether they are in their religious group or out of it, whether they've been trafficked or exploited or gone down a path where they originally made the choice. It doesn't matter where people are in their journey. They still should be met where they're at and receive services and help. I live in the town where the primary prophet was Warren Jeffs. This is considered fundamentalist Mormonism or fundamentalist LDS. They're called FLDS. They wear the prairie dresses and they're demonized all the time in the news. So. I help people who still believe in Warren Jeffs, and I help people who have left the FLDS. I feel all people deserve to be treated with dignity, and that's for some reason controversial. I get attacked because people say, you shouldn't help the people who are still in their group, only help the ones who've escaped polygamy. Well, that's, you know what? I'm not gonna do the thing where we say, you made your bed, you sleep in it. Mm -hmm. That's inhumane. The truth is, if you need help, you deserve help, period. So my motto is stop judging and start helping. The explosion of true crime in the last 20 years has coincided with the rise of the internet and social media and the collapse of barriers and gatekeepers to an audience. It's now easier than ever for anyone to share their true crime speculations via blog or podcast. So it's perhaps not surprising that many of the ethical missteps of true crime come from content creators who don't have training in older, more cautious forms of media, like print media and documentary, where journalists follow an official code of ethics. So we thought we'd wrap up this mini-series by talking with a few old-school writers who paid their dues before the current wave of true crime. Up next, Mark Olshacker and John Ronson.
Mark Olshacker is the co-author of Mind Hunter, Killer Across the Table, When a Killer Calls, and other books with retired FBI agent John Douglas, who pioneered the science of criminal profiling. We interviewed Olshacker back in episode 24 of Labyrinths, Sex, Violence, and Pestilence, where he offered some insight into the pandemic. Mark also has co-authored books about epidemiology with Dr. Michael Osterholm. But this time, we wanted his thoughts on true crime. He came at the genre from a unique place, for he had already written several mystery thriller novels and produced science documentaries for PBS. And when he ventured into telling stories about real-life crimes, he did so in partnership with a veteran law enforcement officer. I wrote and produced an Emmy-nominated program called Mind of a Serial Killer, in which I got to know John Douglas, who was sort of the living legend of profiling. And sometime after the show was on, he called me and said, I'm getting ready to retire. Do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And I said, well, I certainly am. Let's go and see what we can find out. We went to New York, talked to a number of publishers. They were interested. We ended up uh, writing and publishing Mindhunter, which was a big bestseller. And we said, well, there's more stories to tell. And we just went on from there. Fast forward a number of years until we were researching a book called Law and Disorder. And what we realized was, from some of John's work post-FBI, that the behavioral profiling skills, criminal investigative analysis techniques that he had developed could not only be used to identify and convict the bad guys, they could also be used to exonerate people who had been falsely accused and falsely convicted. He had worked on the John Benet Ramsey case and became absolutely convinced, as was I, that the parents had nothing to do with it, that they had been falsely accused in the press, by the public, by prosecutors and police. He went on to investigate the West Memphis Three case. I had heard about your case, Amanda. I started looking into it. Like most people, I assumed that this attractive young American girl and Italian boy were guilty because that was a great story. And the more we looked into it, I said, this is crazy. This case makes no sense. I told John and he said, don't tell me anything about it. Just give me the evidence. We had a set of crime scene photos. We had a lot of the other evidence. He came back to me about a week later and said, you're absolutely right. They had nothing to do with it. And that's kind of where you and I met. And I'm very proud of the way you've conducted yourself in the years since. I feel very close to you. And I feel that you have paid it forward, all the people who supported you, by getting yourself involved in the false accusation and exoneration movement. And I really feel, Amanda, that you and Chris have become heroes and standards for uh, oh. <laughs> this very noble and necessary undertaking. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You're, I mean, that's an honor to hear from you because I feel like of all the people that I'm going to be talking to about the art of storytelling around mm -hmm. these real life tragedies and horrors that happen, I feel like you're probably the best person to talk to. Now that we're talking about good versus bad true crime, when does true crime get it wrong? What does that look like? The good true crime is really a look into the human condition. But it's the human condition writ large at the extremes. Why do people do the things they do? When true crime gets it wrong is when it's not responsible. And your case and the West Memphis Three case, the John Benet Ramsey case, are perfect examples of that. When the story is better than the truth, better than the evidence, that's really dangerous. I've done lectures and talks where I've gone through the entire John Benet Ramsey case, and I said, all right, let's take all the evidence together. And if you compare the crime scene with the medical examiner's report, it's quite clear that the parents couldn't have done it. Let's walk through it and we'll see that the evidence shows this. And I can't tell you how many times, and Amanda, I know you've heard this about a million times. I say, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I still think they were guilty. Or mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying about Amanda, but I still think she had something to do with it. I mean, it has nothing to do with evidence. 
as a writer, my greatest responsibility is to keep the reader interested. And as a true crime reporter, if you will, my greatest responsibility, as is yours, is to focus on the evidence and what we perceive to be the truth. What is your read on why certain cases become hugely publicized and repeatedly dissected over time, and some cases just disappear into the ether and nobody notices them or remembers them? Yeah, that's a very good question and an important one. The same week that John Binet was murdered, a little black girl of approximately the same age was murdered in a Chicago housing development. Nobody knows about that it, because people didn't care. And one of the reasons was people perceive that's common. Hmm. And to a an, certain extent, it is. And that's a great tragedy. But I think to answer your question directly, what makes cases archetypal is when there are larger principles or themes involved. Let's take the Ramsey case. It was about rich people. It was about success. It took place on Christmas. It was about parental overstep. Should the parents have allowed this little girl to be part of these beauty contests? So it was about exploitation of young girls. It was about what is the American dream? All of these things. And could somebody like these parents actually do something so horrible to their children? And I think the reason your case got the same kind of international attention was you were the all-American girl. You know, I've heard somebody said, how can this girl who looks like a J. Crew model have been so involved in something so bloody and horrible and evil? And so that's fascinating to people. How could two really smart, pretty, industrious girls get into this kind of uh, whatever it was and one ends up killing the other? On the other hand, it could have been one of the four residents of the house was unfortunate enough to be home when somebody broke in. She surprised him. He went after her with a knife. He assaulted her. He took her phone. He took her money and ran off. That's what happened, but that's not nearly as interesting. Mm. John and I wrote a book some years ago called The Cases That Haunt Us. We started with murder cases that were, for some reason, never solved to people's satisfaction. We started off Jack the Ripper. It wasn't the first serial murder case by any means, I'm sure, but it seemed like it. At the same time that these crimes were going on in the East End, in the West End, a theatrical version of Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was playing in a theater there. So this becomes a true exposition of evil. What's going on? And how could people do this kind of thing? Lizzie Borden, how could a very proper daughter of a very proper businessman in a very proper archetypal New England town kill her father and her stepmother and for what reason? These are very tantalizing things. Probably the crime of the century, if you will, was the Lindbergh kidnapping. If the baby son of the most famous man in the world can be kidnapped from his own bedroom, mm. is anybody safe? Mm. What does that say about the world? So I think that's probably why, you know, you can almost predict which cases are going to have legs, if you will. And by the same token, profilers will tell you the more ordinary the case, the less they have to work with. I mean, you could profile the robber or the burglar, but it's not going to tell you much because it's going to describe 10,000 people. So right. I think the uniqueness of a case is probably what sets it out. And if it seems to have these larger thematic issues. What are your guiding principles as someone who is going to be writing about these very, very difficult, tragic horror stories that happened in real life? That's an interesting question. And I'll take that from two different perspectives. From the perspective of professional responsibility, I would say the first thing is you follow the evidence. Absolutely. The second thing is there's a tendency to write about criminals as if they are very charismatic, they're heroes. Again, going back to the Old West, you saw people like Billy the Kid and Jesse mm -hmm. James were considered very glamorous people when in fact they were murderous psychopaths. So the first thing is 
we always humanize the victims because they are the center of the story. And we never, ever glamorize the perpetrators in any way. We want to try to explain the perpetrators as best we can, what made them the way they are, but in no way glamorize them. Hmm. Now, that's on one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation is, how do I make readers interested? And to me, the key function is keep them turning the pages. What happens next? That is the watchword I go by all the time. If I can get my readers wanting to know what happens next, then I've succeeded. Is it ever the right choice to simply not tell a story? Sure. An ethical situation where you're like, well, maybe there is no right way to do this and it, it's not my job to tell it. Sure. If we felt like we were invading the privacy of a victim or the family, I'd probably stay away from it. But what's very interesting, Chris, is that in our books, we really try to be descriptive about what was done to the victims. And in every case where I've had the opportunity or the access, I've always gone to the survivors and say, this is what I think we ought to do, but I can be as specific or as general as will make you comfortable. Hmm. And with virtually all cases, they all say, no, I want you to write what happened to my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband, Hmm. my mother or father, because I want you to know what they suffered from, what this person did to them. So I've been surprised in a way, but it's been pretty consistent that the victims and their families really want the truth out there. How common is it, do you think, or do you know, for storytellers to actually approach victims and survivors to ask them their preference about how the story is told? Well, I think they should. I started out in journalism, and so I'm used to talking to people, trying to go right to the source and find out what they think. So I would hope that they would do that. You know, when we write about old cases, cases that happened a hundred years ago or more, obviously you don't have that opportunity. But when you do, you should. I'll give you another example. When we were doing a film for Nova about the Lindbergh kidnapping case, I contacted uh, Reeve Lindbergh, who was Charles uh, Ann Lindbergh's youngest daughter. And I asked her to participate in the show. I showed her the outline, told her what I wanted to do. And she said, from your previous work, I know that you have all good intentions and integrity about doing this, but I don't want to participate for the simple reason that every time something new comes out about this case, another 10 people emerge Mm -hmm. claiming to be my murdered brother who grew up. And I just don't want that kind of sensationalism. And I could understand that, and I didn't press her any further. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So when a crime occurs, obviously you have the central victim as a a grieved or interested party. But you also have society, right? Sure. Crimes against individuals are also wrens in the social fabric. Absolutely. And I feel like there is a social public interest in awareness of how crime happens. The ethical sticking place I'm curious about is a situation where, say, the direct victim, family of someone who was murdered, doesn't want people making a documentary They're like, let us keep this private grief to ourselves. But if it was a public case and if it was all over the news and if there was a manhunt and it took the FBI 10 years to find him, you know, all that stuff is so so titillating to documentary producers and true crime bloggers and podcasters. There's a lot of situations where people are making that content anyway, even if the family of the victim would prefer for it to sort of fade away or remain their own private thing. And I think a lot of them justify it to themselves that, well, this has entered the public imagination. And this happens with Amanda's and Meredith's situation, right? No one's asking the Kircher family if they want yet another documentary about this, right? But it just keeps on happening over and over despite the wishes of the people involved. 
Yeah, I mean, that is a factor in our lives today. And I would say, first of all, we as documentary filmmakers, as true crime writers, we have to be a little more circumscribed in what we do because we sort of have a choice about it. On the level of daily journalism, you're right, the public does have a right to know and a certain amount of reporting is necessary to get it on the public record. And I'm a big believer in that. So I think probably these things have to be worked out on a case by case basis. I think it's a knife edge. We have to walk. Author and podcaster John Ronson is also quite familiar with walking that ethical knife edge. We interviewed John back in episode eight of Labyrinths, a humorous journalist out of his depth. John has become a friend of ours. And aside from his excellent books like The Psychopath Test and So You've Been Publicly Shamed, he's covered true crime stories in various forms. And because he's almost neurotically concerned with ethics, we thought we'd get him on the line for a closing word. One of the reasons why I look up to you so much is I feel like you're the master of walking the fine line of ethics in investigative journalism. And you like acknowledge that you're coming from your own place of experience and biases. And as a storyteller, you want a good story. And on the other hand, you know, you're not like barging into people's apartment buildings and being like, what did you do this day at this time? You know, like, I feel like you're so, so good at having a great intuition about your own impact on people. It's the footprint thing. There's people out there who just, who don't mind leaving footprints all over the place. And then there's other people who realize you want to be on your deathbed and have caused as little hurt to people as as possible. You know, I spend my life trying to solve mysteries, so I certainly have empathy for other people who want to try and do that. But if you're going to do it outside the constraints of a media organisation, which has its own set of ethical rules, not to mention legal rules, you're going to have to really think hard about creating your own ethical framework. How did you create your ethical framework? As I got older, I became more and more empathetic to the extent that sometimes you can be so empathetic that holds you back because you're worrying like way too much about the ethics of the story. Somewhere along the line, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I started to realize the power that I and every other nonfiction writer has. You have to really think about the power you have or else you're just trampling over people. What do you do as a journalist if you're on the receiving end of what ultimately amount to whispers? You don't make hay with them. If somebody tells a journalist something, ex- you know, extremely damaging about an interviewee that turns out to not be true, you don't put the damaging thing out there. And anyway, you can't for legal reasons. You just don't do it. The times have changed and the interviewees rights are taken far more into account than they would have been 10, 20, 30 years ago. Ultimately, like so many things in life, it's all down to consent. When you're telling stories about real people, real tragedies, real crimes, and real victims, the ethical pitfalls are everywhere. And honestly, that has led us to move away from making true crime content ourselves. It's worth asking, why make it at all? If you had to say what the purpose of true crime is, what would you say it was? Well, on a theoretical or thematic or highfalutin level, I'd probably say it's to try to rebalance the universe in favor of justice by giving the victim their due and trying to get on the public record what really happened. On another level, I think it's the same as my novels or Chris's novels, which are to tell a story that will give us a better sense of what it means to be human in one way or another. At its best, it's an exercise in empathy. And empathy is what connects us one person to another. And so I hope at its best, True crime lets people know what other people go through, lets them sense those emotions, let them have an appreciation for the struggles, the trials that victims go through that 
law enforcement personnel go through, that lawyers do. I think that's at its best, and it's obvious what it is at its worst. Hmm. Yeah, to distill that down to two words, it might be judgment versus empathy. Absolutely, yep. As we wrap up this mini-series, one thing is certain. All this hand-wringing about ethics can be exhausting. Even figuring out how to construct this mini-series has been overwhelming for us at times. It's like every time you make an editorial choice out of ethical concerns, you end up creating a new ethical dilemma. Cutting some portion of an interview that may traumatize one person could equally end up removing context that encourages the audience to misinterpret and wrongly judge someone else. It's a maddening balancing act. You can worry too much about ethics. Um, you know, there's actually a word for that in mental health that's called scrupulosity, <laughs> where you worry too much about ethical concerns. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> yeah, well, that's journalism. You know, we, these, are, these, are the, these are the things that haunt. You know, well, in, you know if, if you're a journalist who does worry about ethics, Ah, just welcome to the world of waking up in the middle of the night thinking you've done something terrible. Because that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, our, uh, that's our lives. It's easy to invest ourselves in other people's tragedies, to justify our right to create and consume content. And it's often hard to see the consequences that can have for those at the center of a tragedy. But we need to face those consequences head on if we want to make meaningful change in this industry. Think of a chemical plant dumping dangerous substances into a river. All along the river are homes with families just like yours. The company that owns the plant profits from its output. They can't easily see the price the people along the river will pay, the birth defects and cancer rates 20 years later. The CEO, the board members, they're not evil. They're just trying to make the company as profitable as possible. That's their job. And it's cheaper to dump the waste in the river. They are part of a corporate system that incentivizes well-meaning people to make disastrous choices, to turn a blind eye. Every industry has costs like this that they can either deal with or pass on to others. And some industries, like the fossil fuel industry, don't even make financial sense unless they pass on massive costs to future generations who will have to deal with the climate impacts of their product. So the question we leave you with is this. What costs is the true crime industry dumping in the river? What mess are true crime content creators leaving for others to pick up? As a media consumer, you have more power than you think. You may not be creating content yourself, but you can choose what media you support and lend your voice to advocate for vulnerable people. The next time that you see a true crime story playing out in the news or on TV, remember that what you are watching is the worst moment of somebody's life. Imagine how you would feel if it was you or your loved one whose story was on that screen. How would you want it to be told? Thank you to everyone who participated. And thank you for listening. It means a lot to us. If you've enjoyed Blood Money, the history and ethics of true crime, stick around. Subscribe to Labyrinths wherever you listen to podcasts and spread the word on social media. We really couldn't do it without you. In the meantime, get lost with us. Find us on Twitter, at Amanda Knox. At Man Under Bridge. And our most groan-worthy pun of all, mate, please leave us a bloody five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Blood Money, a Labyrinth miniseries, is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. This episode was written, edited, and produced by us and Sophia Gates, with theme music by Josh Budo Karp. And our most groan-worthy pun of all, mate. What? Of all, mate? You know, like a British accent. Why am I doing that? It's a bloody five-star review. No? <sighs>
Why do I have to do all the grown worthy <laughs> puns? You always make me do them. And our most grown worthy pun of all, mate. Please leave us a bloody five star review on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, that, how that, was, that, <laughs> that was a little heavy. <laughs> well, Just tone it down a little bit. I don't know how to tone it down. I only know how to be a cartoon character. This <laughs> is <laughs> just, you know, half of that. And a most grown worthy pun of all, mate. <laughs> I can't do it. And our most grown worthy pun of all, mate. Please leave us a bloody five star review on. You don't have to go full you British do accent. It. I can't do it. I have to be <laughs> an right. orphan, see, like an street. orphan child in, <laughs> in Victorian London. Yes, that's what I have to be. Okay. You know we're going to include your British. Uh, attempt your no. <laughs> as an Easter Don't. egg. Don't. It's offensive, I'm sure. <laughs> Hello, listener. This episode of Labyrinths could be ad-free, but that requires exclusive access. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to become a monthly Patreon subscriber, which will grant you access to top-secret patron-only content. This podcast will self-destruct without your support. Was that too cheesy? Who doesn't like cheese? Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson.